Hi guys, my name is Bobby. Welcome back to my channel. And today I'm bringing you my July wrap up. So in July, I read nine books, which is the best I've done all year so far. Audiobooks, audiobooks, audiobooks. I only read one thing physically and it was a horror novella that was like 100 pages and I read in 20 minutes, half an hour, one sitting. It's all mixed media format, so it was really quick to read. But anyways, nine. I did, well, technically seven because I DNF two, but I got a good way into both before I DNF, so I'm counting them as read. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So this isn't a 10 million hour long video, even though Jamie would be happy with that. First book I read in the month of July, which I think I started at the very end of June and finished right at the beginning of July, was The Invisible Girl by Lisa Jewell. So this is my third or fourth Lisa Jewell book that I've read. I've been trying really hard to knock off some of my book of the month books that I have because I have this really bad habit of getting them and just forgetting to pick them up. So I'm trying to work through them or get rid of ones I've lost interest in and donating them. And by donate, I mean give to my friend Sarah. Either way. Invisible Girl tells the story. It is very much a Lisa Jewell where it is a lot of family drama and dynamics. That's one thing I love about her books. They're very, very soapy and they're always, and this was three stars. It was, oh, they're always like three star books for me. They're never, I don't, I, maybe one I've given a four, but they're never higher than a four. And they're usually never lower than a three. They're usually a three or a four because you know what to expect from a Lisa Jewell. They're not scary. They're not necessarily super thrilling. They're just very soapy family neighborhood drama with a twist. And the twist is not necessarily always something you can see coming, but it's still good enough to make the book enjoyable and you keep reading. So this book has three main points of view. The first is Owen, who is a disgraced teacher from a school where he was let go because some girls accused him of sweating on them at a party like or a dance or something like that kind of weird and convoluted he lives with his aunt has kind of a weird past and he's trying to navigate being i don't know what, what's the word for it like just trying to be himself he's like in his early 30s still a virgin um so he's trying to like find his footing in life his neighbors kate and rowan are a family of four. They have two children, a boy and a girl. And it's, you get Kate's point of view as she tries to navigate being a mom of two teenage kids that are, especially her son is kind of weird. Her husband Rowan is a therapist and he is home late all the time. She's not really sure what's going on. She thought for a while he was having an affair, but like had done all this investigation, including like breaking into his personal files at work and accused him and found out to be, she was wrong. So they still, they're still working through all of that. And then she has two kids. I can't remember their names. The boys, the boy has an important part of the story but their, see their names isn't even said in the dust jacket. So I don't really, I don't remember. And then you follow Sapphire, who is a mixed race girl whose both parents are dead and she, or yes, both parents are dead. She lives with her uncle and is kind of, she suffered a trauma when she was younger that she does not speak about, but she went to Rowan for therapy years ago. And in this story, she's kind of following him around and you don't know, is it because she's obsessed with him or if she's spying on him, like what's going on? And so you got all three of these people, well, all four main people, but you get three of their points of view. And of course they all come together at the end. This was a typical Lisa Jewell book. I have really, really enjoyed it. Gave it three stars. It was really easy listen, quick to get through. There was, was there one part in this book where I was like, where I was shocked or was that one of the other ones? I can't remember. I can't remember. I read so many, um, but this one, this one was good. Like if you like Lisa Jewell, it's a good one. Pick it up. You'll probably enjoy it. Very quick read. And again, three stars. The next book I read finally is The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon. This is book one in a fantasy series. I know there are four, four, four books out plus a novella. And I know there's at least one more to come, maybe two. I don't know. Um, Ashley to Frolic Through Fiction. This is one of her favorite series. i I've had this book for a while and I finally decided to pick it up. This is a fantasy series that takes place in the future. And so it's like our future, our world. It takes place in London where this company or whatever called Zion has taken over the governments of the world. And with them being telepathic or have any kind of paranormal powers is illegal or um, fortune telling powers. Like what do they call it? Why can't I think of the word? 
that's like uh, clairvoyant, anybody with clairvoyant powers, it's illegal. Paige has clairvoyant power powers. She's kept it under wraps forever. She works for the criminal underworld in London. And one of the days she, one day she just accidentally shows her clairvoyant powers is captured. And she thinks that everybody who is caught is killed. And she quickly finds out that's not the case. And the story kind of goes from there. This was super fun. This was four stars. I really, really enjoyed it. It wasn't quite five for me. Um, there is no romance in this one. Uh, it's very much like prior to the orange tree. Samantha Shannon is very, very slow, slow burning if she ever has romances in her books. And there's one where you can kind of see it starting to happen, but it wasn't until the very end and very, very slow burn. Um, I really enjoyed the world building and how the world has changed and with the different clairvoyance and there's different levels of clairvoyancy and like what they all can do. And it was really cool concept and I really enjoyed it. So I have the Mime Order in my August TBR, the sequel. So I want to finish it. I need to pick up a new book because as of right now, we it is August 6th and I have yet to finish anything, but I am 500 pages into the stand. So I'm almost halfway done at the stand. So I consider that a win. That's at least almost a book or two books worth of book read. But I think I'm going to pick something else, else up here soon to kind of offset the stand so I don't kind of slump. But yes, my mortar will get read in August. But this was very, very good. I would suggest this if you like... <sighs> If you loved Priority of the Orange Tree, definitely read this. I'm trying to like think of what else that I can kind of compare this to. Because it's not as bloody or anything like that. Like the Nevernight series. It's not as complex as the Book of the Ancestor trilogy. But it's still really good. Like I'm compelled to read more. Like I want to know what's going to happen. Um, it, it was interesting because there's certain characters in this book that aren't quite human. But you don't know what they are. And I want to know what the fuck they are. So I'm, I'm, yeah, so glad I finally picked this up. I, there was one point in this book that I was reading it and my, I was listening to it. And my son came in and said something to me and I was so sucked into the book. And I think I was playing a game on my phone or my tablet or something. And I was so sucked into the book that when he spoke to me, it made me jump because I was so invested. So if it sounds up your alley, read it. It's adult. It's not YA, it's adult. Um, and there are some adult themes in here, but it, it's not severe this would be a good transition from YA to adult I think because it's not uh, so far from what I understand as you get further along in the books there's a lot more heavier topics so and I hear it kind of kind of kills your insides so looking forward to continuing but also kind of scared the next book is one of my DNFs this year or this year this month and I'm really upset about it because I've read every single book by this author which includes the um Oh, actually, I guess the next next two books on my list are both my DNFs. So, uh, yeah, this one I was really, really sad to DNF, but I just couldn't get into it. Um, and that's We Sold Our Souls by Grady Hendrix. Now, I love Grady Hendrix. I talk about him all the time. I absolutely adore Grady Hendrix. I've read every single one of his books now that has been published. I didn't like this one at all. Um, I didn't rate it, but this one was boring. It was just boring. I got over 100 pages in and I just didn't care. So this tells the story of a woman, what's her name? I can't even remember her name. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Her name's Chris. She was part of a big metal band back in like the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. They got pretty, they were on the brink of getting famous, but never actually got super famous. Then all of a sudden their lead singer just takes off and he's super famous and is like kind of compared to like probably like a Marilyn Manson, like just super fucking famous. And meanwhile, all the band members are pretty much a destitute. She works in a Best Western now. And in the beginning of the story, she starts talking about like stuff that they did when they were younger. And the whole premise of the story is that the lead singer sold all his band mem bandmate souls to the devil for stardom. So it becomes Chris trying to get all the other bandmates back together to go after the lead singer. And I mean, I got to a part that was super gory and, you know, I was like, oh, okay, but I just didn't care. And I think it's just because I didn't connect with Chris. She seemed very whiny to me. Like, yeah, your dreams didn't come true and it sucks that he got famous and you didn't, but you could have still made something with your life and you chose not to. So I just didn't really feel the sympathy for her that you're supposed to feel. And I just didn't connect with her. So after about a hundred and hundred or so pages, I think it was even more than that. I think it was close to 150. I just didn't give a fuck anymore. So I DNF'd it, which is sad. And I'm going to keep it because I own all of Grady Hendrix books, but just wasn't a favorite. Next was my other DNF. So Mara over at Books Like Woe was running a readathon this month. 
um, what did she call like the Nor it was a pretty much Nora Roberts read along where everybody just reads as much Nora Roberts as they can or wanted to. So I used to read Nora Roberts back in like my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, like somebody had suggested her to me and I picked up a couple of her books. And they're not bad. I mean, she writes thriller romances. So there's always a romance plot in her books. But there's a thriller aspect always as well. So you always have some kind of mystery you're trying to solve or something like that. So I picked up one of her newest books. I think it was on Scribd or my library on audio. And that's Hideaway. So this tells the story of I'm trying to go by memory. Um, this is a story of a really famous Hollywood family made up Hollywood family. They have this really beautiful estate in um, it's on, like on the bluffs on the Pacific Coast Highway. I'm, I can't it's not Malibu. I can't remember where where it is. But they have this really beautiful estate and all the family comes like at least once a year during the summer and they all get together. And at the beginning of this book, they've all gotten together for um, the patriarch's funeral. So there's like grandma and grandpa, whatever grandpa just died. And then you've got their children and then their kids. So grandpa just died and you're following, I think her name is Kate. If I remember right. Oh, let's see. I'm going to look at the synopsis because to at least get her name. Oh, Big Sur. That's where the, the big family house is. Caitlin. Yeah, so Caitlin. So Caitlin is at the time, the beginning of the book, when her grandfather dies, she's like nine, 10, 10, I think. She's 10 years old. Her entire family is famous actors. And so like, I think they all met on set. Even her dad is a famous actor and like her aunts, or she have an aunt and an uncle, I believe. And then her, both of her grandparents and the patriarch dies. And so she is on their big estate at Big Sur and she's playing hide and seek with her cousins and she is abducted and that so you have like that whole story of her abduction and this is okay mild spoiler but this really happens in the very beginning of the book she's abducted is taken to this house that is not too far away from where her family's estate is but it's the people who normally live there or own it or living at their other house at the time so these two like early 20s thugs like have her trapped or whatever and she's a super smart girl she manages to get out and escape she escapes out a window even though they had the windows nailed shut she saved a spoon from a bowl of soup or whatever and used that to pry up the nails she uses her sheets to climb down she runs to this house and meets like and let like, well meets she breaks into this house and there is a mom a son and a grandmother living there and the son finds her first and he's I think 16 so he's like six years older than her um realizes she's traumatized and freaked out of course they call the cops she goes back to her family so you have that starts the story so I guess I'm going into spoilers of everything I've read sorry um but it's it was just odd because it was just nothing really happened so that happened I thought that was going to be the bulk of the story it wasn't it was the beginning and then you show see her as an adult and she's doing all these things and it's just I don't know it was just weird so you see her in new york and like and she goes to ireland like after the trauma but you don't hear about anything about her living in ireland or her grandmother's death and then she's in new york and it's like all this weird shit is just happening or was it her great grandmother her great grandparents and her grandma it, like, whatever it's a huge family of actors and so it shows her like kind of going through early part of 20s and then oh i'm gonna go finally go back to big sur and so she does and hooks up with the boy who was there on the night that she escaped or whatever and his name's Callan and it's like then they just like reconnect or whatever but it's weird because when they reconnect as adults in the story when they were younger he's like 16 and she's like 10 but when they reconnect she's like mid-20s or something like that it's almost like they're the same age because he's still in college so technically she should still be like a teenager like it just didn't make sense and I honestly got bored I was like usually I love stories like that where it's multi-generational families and like actors in Hollywood like I love Jackie Collins and like the drama bullshit that those books are but this one like there was no chemistry between Kate and Callan and you knew that they were going to get together there was no chemistry it was very forced and I was just like Ugh. I mean I read over half of this book and DNF'd it so I might try one of her other ones again but I don't know, maybe I just wasn't in the mood I mean I just got bored so I was like man I mean give it a try if it sounds good but I just, yeah, I just got bored. So because I made it just over halfway, I gave it two stars. Next, I read Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. And this was fucking fantastic. 
this was five stars. I don't know if it's going to be a favorite of the year or not. Maybe, but this was fucking fantastic. This is book one. I believe it's a trilogy. Um, I I know book two is up there. I don't know if it's been announced yet. Sorry if the angles changed. I hope it looks straight. I had to take my phone out because my boss called me just to troll me. So anyways, lost my train of thought. I was looking up the names in Black Sun because they're very, very, very fantastical. And I read this at the beginning of July. So I had to remember. So this is a very complex fantasy world, but it's not super complex to where you can't understand what's going on. It's very easy to follow and you have three POVs. Is it three? One, three. No, four. You have four POVs. The fourth POV doesn't come in until midway through the book. So you're following different people throughout this world and you're, he you're heading towards a big event. But at the beginning, like you don't really know what the event is. So at the beginning of each chapter, it says um, year 315 of the sun, 10 years before convergence. So you're like, well, what is convergence? What does this mean? Like you don't you don't know what's going on. So you start out following Serapio. Serapio at the very beginning is a little boy in the very first chapter and then you do another time jump. And at the very start of each chapter, it tells you exactly how many years until convergence and what year it is so you can understand the time jumps better. Um, a lot of Serapio's chapters take place in the past and then he converges up into the future. Serapio is a boy that lives in these mountains away from the major cities in this world. And when he's a very young boy, his mom forcibly blinds him and says that he's destined for greatness and all this stuff. And you're kind of going, what the heck is going on? And then you kind of follow him as he comes into Ziala's story. And Ziala is a female who is like, I don't, what's, I can't remember what she's called. She's a certain race that can do, that has like certain abilities that are kind of rare. Um, everybody in this story is a person of color. And there are, um, why, bleh, I can't think. And everybody uses non-binary pronouns, only it is Z and Zer. So it's spelled, used as X's as instead of like he, her, or, you know, she, she, her, he, him, it's Z and Zer. Um, it's, it was very hard to understand listening to the audiobook when they would say those things. I actually looked at my physical book to see because I thought it was another name because when it's pronounced it sounds like it could be another fantastical name and it's not it they're just using um non-gender pronouns which was really awesome but they are also all people of color this is also written by a woman of color so it was anyways Giala Giala's a woman of color she is a sea captain and she is asked to captain this boat to take Serapio to Tova and usually they don't travel the seas this time of year because there's a lot of storms, but she comes from a race that can kind of control the water. So it was really interesting watching them two together, like start to develop a friendship, you know, with Serapio being blind and Giala is kind of a hardened, bi and she's bisexual, hardened kind of bisexual sea captain. And then you have Narampa or Nara, who is a sun priest, who is in Tova for what is going to be the convergence which is supposed to be like i think it's an eclipse of some kind like black sun it's an eclipse of some kind and it's very much in the religions and the politics and nara is struggling to keep her position as a sun priest and then i can't remember the name of the other guy um i'm a terrible person i can't remember the name of the other character but he doesn't come in until halfway through and he his family lives in Tova, but he is from, he was in a camp or whatever for army. I'm not, I'm not being very clear. And so he's brought back because his mother has died. And so he gets all wrapped up with Narampa and the sun priest. And it, it's just, it's all, all the things are happening. And I'm not describing this very well at all. It is a very, very good book. I was very, very sucked in. I love all the representation in it. It was a really awesome fantasy world, though I will say I preferred to be with um, Giala and Serapio more than I did um, Nara and the other dude. I I just didn't care about them as much. Like Nara's problems were problems that you see in every single fantasy book. You know, oh, she's a priest or a person of power and somebody else is fighting for her to, 
fighting against her to take that power to steal it from under her. Giallo was just a very interesting protagonist and so was Serapio and I enjoyed being with them a lot. The one qualm I had about this book, I almost thought about bumping it down to four, was the ending was very, very rushed and this very much felt like a setup book for the next two. Normally you have like the second book slump. I think this one's going to have a, um, it's like the first book is kind of the slumpier book because it's very much set up for the series where you get all of the backstory on these characters for the most part, especially Serapio. But you get a nice backstory and then when you get to the the convergence, it was kind of rushed and you didn't, it's like you were told and not shown, which the rest of the book you were shown. So I was kind of upset that when we got there, we didn't really see what happened. We just kind of saw the aftermath and then it just ended. It was very abrupt. So it almost felt like to me that this was written to be longer and then it was cut back into to be multiple books maybe. Yeah, so the ending was a little rushed, but I still loved it and I can't wait to get the second book because this was fucking fabulous. I absolutely loved it and I'm mad I waited so long to get it. But I highly recommend it if you like fantasy, if you like really different fa or fantasy worlds, if you're looking for fantasy with a lot of diversity, this definitely has a lot of diversity. Um, Harry, if you're watching, you'll love this, especially with everybody being addressed as non-binary. You would absolutely adore it. Or especially everybody in Tova. Everybody in Tova is addressed as non-binary, which is is awesome if you're looking for that kind of rep. But yeah, um, five stars. Just because I loved Ziala and Serapio so much and I just, I just want to be back with them. When I finished, I was just like, oh, I need the next one. So this was more five stars based on enjoyment of reading than the content. The next book I read was another four star. I wished it was five, but only ended up being four. And that's the Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. Read two Grady Hendrix this month. One I hated and DNF'd in this one I loved. This is his newest book. It came out July 13th. Thank you very much, Cody, at Cody's Book Corner for pre-ordering this for me uh, for Christmas, even though it came out three days after my birthday. Um, but this tells the story of Lynette and she is a final girl. So of course, final girls are girls that are the last girl standing at the end of a big giant uh, massacre of some kind. Think Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, shit like that. There's a big massacre. There's one girl left. There are five, five, one, two, three, four, four, five, five. There's five final girls. I'm trying to like trying to name them all in my head. And they have their own little support group where they meet every month, I believe, or every week with their therapist and they talk about things. And you have final girls that have been in, most of them are older, like 80s, 90s is when their trauma happened. And so this takes place in present day. So they've been in this group for 20 plus years and just being supportive of each other. So Lynette is very, very paranoid. It's actually really sad because with her, she has made her apartment into a fortress so nobody can get in, nobody can attack her. She doesn't go out very much at all. She has everything delivered if she can. She's very much still living in her trauma, even though it happened to her so long ago. And what I find fun about this story, all five girls are based off of another uh, off a slash movie except for the main character Lynette. I don't remember a horror story where there is a killer Santa Claus. I know there was like a um oh that's uh the, with the crypt keeper it's on the tip of my tongue um why can't I think of the name of that show? There was um an episode on that that had a killer Santa that was loose but that's kind of Lynette's story. All the other ones are based off of a horror movie. So Danny is based off Halloween um, Heather is based off of Nightmare on Elm Street, only with a twist. There isn't a dream demon. It's a creepy custodian who is a pedophile and murdered teenage girls. Um, Julia was, uh, Scream and Marilyn was Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Adrian was Friday the 13th. So they, it, their stories are a little bit different, but you can totally see which one they take after. So these girls in a support group, um, Lynette goes home one day, she's attacked in her home, manages to escape, and she starts to realize that everybody's trying to kill the last final girl. Somebody's trying to kill them off. And so the story kind of goes from there as you're trying to figure out who it is. I figured it out early on who was the one doing the killing, which didn't necessarily bother me because I loved all the horror movie references. Very much 80s slasher reminded me a lot of, um, season 1984 from American Horror Story. It was 
he per he makes fun of the satanic panic there's like mixed media in here of transcripts of these women when they were girls and right after their trauma there are little ads for the movies that were made based on their um on their traumas there's yeah it, it was cool there was all this different cool stuff in there but adrian's the first one to be murdered and this makes lynette freak out and she's trying to get all the other girls together and make them realize oh shit we're being attacked this is normal Grady Hendrix. I love his writing. I love his wit and his humor. The, he very much touches on why we as a society are so fascinated with slasher films and like the murder of women. And, you know, the characters bring it up multiple times and he's not wrong. So I love this. I gave it four stars. Wasn't quite a five for me. My favorite is still Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying, Slaying Vampires, but this is a close second. This one is, this one was pretty good too. If you love 80s and early 90s slasher horror films, then this is definitely one you want to pick up because you'll love all of the horror movie Easter eggs in it. Oh, I forgot another book that I DNF'd um, about halfway, little more than halfway through, um, but I picked up Desperate Measures by Katie Robert. This is book one in the monster, it's some, uh, some series, Wicked Villains, I think. Yes, Wicked Villain series. This is a fantasy romance series where it takes what you know about uh, Disney princesses and different stuff like that and puts a twist on it and makes it porn, pretty much. So I went into these, um, I started it, is that my cat? I picked this up starting the series thinking I was gonna get another fantasy romance with some smut where we had plot but smut. That's not what this was. I need some plot in my fantasy romance. I can't read stuff that's just straight erotica. This is pretty much straight erotica. This is a Jasmine and Jafar retelling where they're a couple. Um, it's very much a daddy kink, which is not my thing at all. The age difference is decent, but not terrible. It's just that she calls him daddy, which is just, ugh, that's just gross. Like I don't, it's the last thing I wanna think about when I'm having sex is my dad. So no. I know a lot of people love that. It's just not my thing. Um, and there was no plot, none. And that's what really bothered me. I think I could have pushed through if there was actual plot and there's not. I don't even, was there even a threat of a plot? Not really. I mean, the book starts and I was kind of like, what? whoa, they're having sex on page four. It was, you know, Jasmine is hanging out in her room and Jafar comes in and is like teasing her and all this shit and pretty much tells her, I killed your father because he's terrible. So now you have the choice to either be mine or I'll make you mine. Like, I'll give you a chance to try to escape. So she goes running. Of course, he catches catches her. And then they have sex, like, in the middle of the hallway, out of nowhere. First time having sex together. It was just weird. It was not... It was just not normal. I was like, okay, all right. Even if she'd been pining for him for years and him, her... you. This is, like, page five. We've had nothing set up that says that they had any kind of surface relationship. Afterwards, the kind of, in her monologue, you would hear, because they they alternate chapters too, so you get both points of view. But you get her saying, oh yeah, I've been pining after him for years and all this stuff, but it's just, yeah. It was just straight erotica, and I'm not, well, I love some smut in my books. Straight erotica is not really my thing. It gets boring, because there's, I need a plot. I need a plot with my sex, okay? need a plot. If they stop every once in a while the fuck, great. But I need a plot. They need to be doing something. There needs to be an end game that is not just an orgasm. Oh, okay. Like I, I just, I need something other. So I DNF this one. I'll try to read The Beast because Lamia got it for me and it's one of her favorites. But I don't know if I'm going to continue with the series because I need a fucking plot. And the plot just can't be two characters that were famous fucking. That's not a plot. That's just porn on paper. So, which... I need a little more. There's nothing wrong with sex and books. I just, I like to read things that aren't just sex and books. It's just not just a book of sex. So yeah, I didn't read it. I DNF'd it. Next book that I read was one that I picked up on a whim. And I think I read it when I was like seven or eight years old. And I decided to listen to it on audio. I was just flipping through Scribd. And I was like, oh God, they have this. Okay. I don't really know what I'm in the mood for, but I guess I'm in the mood for this. And I listened to Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. So this is the book that the movie is based on. And let me tell you, very different from the movie um but not in a bad way in a good way i think the movie did the book justice i think it did everything that the book was intending to do 
there was certain things from was it the lost world or jurassic park 3 that they pulled from the original book like i can't remember if it's the lost world or jurassic park 3 in the very beginning of the movie the little girl's playing on the beach and she gets bit by the little baby dinosaurs or the little ones i know it's not in the first jurassic park i know it's in one of the other ones that happens at the very beginning of the book so then they're trying to figure out it's like the oh they've gotten off island um the guy that gets eaten by the raptor in the very beginning when they're trying to load it in and he falls and gets sucked into the pen in the book that happens but he survives and he goes back to one of the main islands to get treatment and the doctor's like this doesn't look like a dog mauling you know this this looks really bad oh no they told him it was an equipment they told her it was an equipment accident she goes no this is a mauling of some kind and the guy ends up dying from his wounds so there's like different different things that happen it's very technical very scientific it explains everything really well it was great listening on audiobook because it was just easier to digest all the characters are there that you see in the movie um lex and tim were interesting because their roles were reversed so in the book tim is older than lex and not the other way around and so all the whining that tim kind of did lex did in the book it, it was interesting because they kind of it's kind of role reversal um, and in the book, Dr. Grant actually does like kids. It wasn't being forced on him. He enjoys kids. And him and Ellie were never a couple in the book. Um, Ellie was already engaged to somebody else. So there's that. Um, but now I'm going to spoil the death list because the deaths in the book and the movie are very different. So if you don't care to read the book um, and you want to know how things are different, I'm going to tell you. So the big fat guy, Dennis... Um, he dies exactly the same way in the movie that he does in the book. The spitter dinosaur spits on him and kills him as he's trying to steal the embryos. It happens in the exact same way. The lawyer dude that dies sitting on the toilet and during when the T-Rex is hanging around, that never happens. Um, in the, that doesn't happen in the book. In the book, um, Dr. Malcolm, Ian, does go try to get the dinosaur away from the kids and he is thrown and hurts his leg. That happens exactly the same. Um, though the guy, there is no guy sitting on the toilet. Uh, the lawyer actually survives in the book all the way till the end. Um, the guy that dies in the book is a tour guide that was sent with them, which he didn't exist in the movie. And he ends up getting killed by a baby T-Rex because there's two T-Rexes in the book. There's a baby and an adult. So it's killed by a baby T-Rex after Dr. Grant gets Tim out of the car um, in the tree. And, the you know, because that, that shit all happened the same. So uh, Ian Malcolm dies in the book. He does not survive. So I think the only reason he survived the movie was because everybody loves Jeff Goldblum and they needed him to be in the sequels. Yeah, he didn't survive. So the leg injury that he got from being thrown when the T-Rex nosed him and threw him, he dies from that wound from infection or whatever before they are rescued. So he doesn't survive. Um, Ellie, Dr. Grant, Tim and Lex all survive, of course. Um, the doctor that is working on the Triceratops in the movie, the when Ellie stops and goes off with him, in the book it's a Stegosaurus, not a t um, Triceratops. And he stays with them on the island. He doesn't leave and he survives until the end. Dr. Wu, who in Jurassic Park has a very minor role. He pops up again in some of the newer movies. He leaves the island in the movie. He leaves and goes on the boat and leaves. In the book he does not. He stays and he's killed by raptors. Um... Muldoon, who is the guy in the movie who is the raptor expert that says clever girl before he's mauled by raptors and eaten. He survives in the book. He does not die. Um, Samuel Jackson's character in the movie, uh, well, I can't remember his name. He dies exact same way as he died or damn near close to the same way that he died in the books or in the, in the movie. Hammond, the old guy who's running the whole park, he dies in the book. He does not survive. So in the consecutive movies, he is passed away like off page or off screen. He dies in the book. He dies the same way the little girl was bit on the beach by those little dinosaurs. He goes on a hike or a walk out of the facility like an idiot out of the safety bunker because he's just so stressed out and falls and twists his ankle and is attacked by these baby dinosaurs and pretty much lets them kill him. So yeah, it, it, it was interesting seeing the difference between the who lives and who dies, but it was a great book. It was very close to the movie. I really, really enjoyed it and I gave it four stars. And the last thing I read was the horror novella that I squeezed in right at the end of the month. Um, I saw Vicky read this. I saw a couple other people read this. I'm like, okay, I have to pick this up. And it's called Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke by Eric LaRocca. Vicky read this in a vlog 
and because it was supposed to be horrible like look at that cover it looks like it's going to be gory and horrific um yeah this is like a three star novella maybe two I don't know I might lower it um I picked this up expecting to get something really gory this tells a story about two lesbian women who start a relationship online this takes place in like the year 2000 so it's like when chat rooms were very fairly new and instant, instant messenger was fairly new like back when we would use like icq and mrc and um M msn messenger and email and like all that so you know they meet up i don't oh she posts something in a or what's the name agnes and agnes is the one woman and the other one is Zoe. So it's Agnes and Zoe. Agnes posts an ad for an apple peeler, like an antique apple peeler on this LGBTQ, I plus, well, LGBT back then, uh, chat room page. Uh, Zoe comments. They start having this conversation. They keep messaging back and forth and emailing back and forth and develop a relationship that quickly devolves into something creepy. So I'm going to spoil this. Um, I, I gave it three but I think I'm gonna bump it to two maybe I, I did give it two I don't remember it was not what I was expecting I was expecting like gory nasty you know something just crazy weird happening I mean on it says on the back it says sadomas sadomasochism obsession and death and it says what have you done today to deserve your eyes so I'm like oh god are they get one of them gonna be gouging out eyes are they gonna be murdering people no no they sure weren't so I'm gonna spoil it now um there wasn't really any gore in all this. Um, the nastiest thing that she did was giving herself a tapeworm. So Agnes becomes obsessed with Zoe and develops a very codependent relationship, even though they've never met in person. It's only online. Zoe wants a sub-dom relationship. So a BDSM kind of sub-subordinate, like submissive, dominant, dominant, whatever, sub-dom relationship. And she pulls up a contract for that. And the contract isn't terrible. It's not something that I would want to do or anything, you know, like that. But it isn't, like, horrific. Um, I think the most horrific thing she says is that she has to sleep naked every night with the air conditioner on full blast to prove her loyalty or whatever. Granted, they've never met in person. It's all online. Agnes doesn't have to do any of the things that Zoe's telling her to do. She can just lie about it because it's online. But she does what she tells her to do. And she really wants a baby. Agnes really wants a baby. Zoe doesn't want babies now or presumably in the near future. And Agnes is really upset about this. So Zoe tells her, well, you can get a parasite, you know, get, give yourself a tapeworm, then something will be growing inside of you, but you will pass it eventually. So she tells her how to get a tapeworm by setting meat outside for like a week and letting it rot and then eating it bugs and gross and nasty shit and all so that was probably the nastiest part of the whole novella is the description of Agnes eating this raw meat it was awful and then she gets a tapeworm refuses to treat herself for it because it's her baby and she's growing it inside of her and Zoe pretty much cuts off contact with her because she's like I'm you're crazy obviously like I didn't think you would actually do it you did it like you need to take care of your health like go get the antibiotics or whatever to kill this tapeworm and then Agnes passes the tapeworm and is like cradling this dead parasite and is all sad because her baby died and that was pretty much it but at the beginning of the book you know that Agnes is dead and that Zoe's being tried and like connection with her death so but you don't learn anything about it so you don't know if did Zoe just go find out where she lived and killed her eventually did Agnes kill herself because she didn't think Zoe loved her anymore like after this tapeworm thing like I don't know it was fucking weird I'm probably gonna get rid of it um it yeah it was like two stars I was expecting something out there and just intense and gross and all that and instead I got a story about a woman who wanted a, a obviously mentally ill woman who uh wanted a baby so she put made sure that she got uh infected with a tapeworm yeah, if I wanted to read a good horror story about worms, I'd just reread the troop. Okay, guys, that's it. That is my July wrap-up. Those are the nine things that I read. I guess technically I only finished six um, since I did DNF three. But even still, it was a great month for me. Like, I was really happy. I was reading a lot. Um, 
and the audiobooks just seem to be helping but I do need to pick up something else because I'm halfway through the stand about and yeah it's only like day six of the month and I'm halfway through the stand but I feel like I haven't read anything because I'm not finished so I mean granted even if I only read that and like two other things this month I mean the stand is 1100 pages so I mean that's an accomplishment in and of itself but I digress Please let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books, what you thought about them. What did you guys read in July? What was your favorite book you read in July? If there's something I need to know about, please let me know because I'm just on a reading rampage right now and I'm just happy to be reading again and consuming all of the books. But that's it, guys. I will see you guys in my next one. Bye.